This is a HeadGum Podcast. Thanks for tuning in to this special Black Girl Nerds Podcast Extra. It's the Get Out episode. This is a fully packed episode about the new social commentary horror film directed by Jordan Peele, written by Jordan Peele, called Get Out. If you have not seen Get Out yet, get your life in order, all right? Just do that right now. Also, there are going to be some spoilers on this episode, so really seriously, if you've not yet seen Get Out, then I would recommend to just stop the podcast right now, walk to your nearest movie theater, or drive, um, or run to your nearest theater and watch the movie, and then come back and listen. So our very first segment is with none other than Mr. Jordan Peele himself, He talks about the film. We ask him questions about how he came up with the idea for Get Out, what's in store next after Get Out, and we also go over fan theories, social media, and also what he purposely put in the movie while getting that together. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this special Get Out edition. In the Jordan Peele interview, it is hosted by yours truly, myself, Jamie Broadnax, and Mel, as well as Kayla and Tora. In our second segment, it's a roundtable discussion hosted by Joy and also featuring Karan and Tora as well as Mel. So sit back, relax, and enjoy our Get Out episode. This is a Black Girl Nerds podcast extra. And by the way, this Sunday we will not have a podcast episode. So just to give you a heads up on that, we'll be at South by Southwest. So join us on March the 10th through the 14th is when we will be there, BGN. And we will have a podcast stage over at South by Southwest. That's going to be March 14th at JW Marriott at 11 a.m. So check that out and we'll have some special guests in store. So stay tuned. Thanks again for listening to this special Get Out episode. Black Girl Nerds Podcast Extra. Enjoy. Jordan Peele is an actor, comedian, film director, and screenwriter. He's best known for starring in the Comedy Central sketch series, Key and Peele, and for five seasons was a cast member on Mad TV. In 2014, he also had a reoccurring role in the first season of the FX anthology series, Fargo. His directorial debut, Get Out, was released in 2017 of this year. We present to you filmmaker, actor, director, and cinematic genius, Mr. Jordan Peele. Thank you for tuning in to this special edition of the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. My name is Jamie. I am your host. This is going to be an epic show because we have someone on that is right now one of the most talked about directors and one of the most talked about films of this year that everybody has gone and seen. And if you have not seen it, you are missing out. We have none other than Mr. Jordan Peele director of Get Out. Jordan, thank you so much for coming on the Black Girl Nerds podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm so, uh, I'm such a fan of your social media presence and, and, uh, yeah, I love it. Thank you. We really appreciate that. And on the call with us is also Kayla, Mel, and Tora. Thank you, ladies, for coming on. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yeah. Happy All right. to be here. <laughs> Let's get into this, shall we? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, Jordan, man, this movie is everything. I mean, there's a reason why this movie has grossed so much money and that it's so highly rated on Rotten Tomatoes. And Get Out, this is one of the kind of films where you kind of have to watch it over and over again to get bits and pieces of certain kind of microaggressions and systemic racism that's addressed. And I was curious to know, how long did it take for you to put this project together? And was there one particular scene in Get Out that resonates with you the most? Well, um, thank you for, for, first of all, that's that's really nice. I am. Yeah. I mean, this, this thing took, you know, I mean, one way to answer is it took like, you know, 25 years, you know, this is, this has so much of me kind of packed into it. Um, but, you know, another way of, of answering it is, 
about eight years since the first seed of the idea. And um, that, that idea sort of marinated for about five years until about two and a half, three years ago. Um, I, I sold it based uh, just off a of pitch. And then uh, from that point forward, I, you know, I wrote the script and then we were, we were moving. Um, and then you're saying, is there a scene that, that resonates with me? Yeah. You know, I mean, there's a couple of scenes. Um, I don't know if you're doing, if like this is, you want to get spoilery in this. Let's do um, it. I <laughs> All right. I'll well, put a disclaimer at the beginning. You put a disclaimer at the beginning. Okay, that'd be great. Um, okay, so I think the, you know, the scenes that really... Uh, <laughs> are my favorite scenes are the, the hypnosis, the first hypnosis sunken place scene. Yeah. I love that. I love, um, I, I, I love the scene with, uh, Betty Gabriel in, uh, Rose's bedroom. And I love the scene with Rose on the bed, um, eating the cereal. So those three kind of like, I can really lose myself when I'm watching it and, sort of forget that I came up with it. <laughs> the scene with Rose in the bed is by far the creepiest scene in the movie. So I, <laughs> I completely agree. I with think you so too. <laughs> that was, I mean, you should have seen me um, directing that scene. Cause it wasn't in the original script. It was kind of like, <sighs> I, 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 I kind of came up with that a couple days before we shot and realized, Oh my God, we got to get this moment. Like what's, what's Rose doing? when um the shit's hitting the fan and you know i just knew that we have uh you know we know so little about her character at this moment that any kind of little specific or detail that sort of help di helps differentiate her is going to be uh is going to be great and, and um so directing that one i was just in in glee because it was just so watching that vision sort of come together and that, that, uh, that image, that powerful symmetrical image. Yeah. I just, I, I knew, I knew people would, would key into it for some reason. You know, get out is fantastic social commentary horror that, like I said before, everybody's talking about. Do you feel this movie will lead to other films in this subgenre? And tell us as well, what's next for you in this subgenre? Um, you know, I don't, you know, I, I, I would, I would hope that, you know, there are some more, you know, untapped voices, minorities, um, uh, gay people, Muslims, Asian Americans, African Americans that, um, get inspired by it. Um, you know, when I, when when I started writing this, I didn't think that this movie was possible, that it was going to get produced myself. Um, I was, I'd already been on, you know, mad TV for five years. And if I felt that way, then I know that there's, you know, we, we haven't necessarily encouraged, um, non-white people to invest the, the, their time into this industry. So I would hope, you know, I'm certainly inspired by it. I, I would hope there's, there's, there's some more genre stuff like this. Um, and then, yeah, I, I'm, you know, I'm going to continue writing and directing, uh, thrillers. I have, uh, several ideas that I've been marinating, um, on for the last eight years. Just an idea to throw out to you. Um, do not touch my hair. From the yes. black woman's experience. <laughs> yes. If you get that you know, made, I want I, credit. <laughs> I I considered having a hair touching moment in this one, but I, uh, you know, it was uh, it, it just didn't make the cut. But that, but that, uh, yeah, I, I, I could see a whole movie um, about that. Sure, <laughs> that's great. Can you talk a little bit about what initially inspired Get Out? And also, like, did you anticipate how much people would connect to and love this movie? Um, you know, the it, it comes from so many different 
inspirations kind of simultaneously. Um, but there was, you know, I, I wanted to make a classic horror film, you know, I wanted to like make something that, you know, and all, all my favorites sort of t- just have something unique about them and, or some kind of, they discuss a, uh, a, f- a fear or a horror that is kind of unique to that film. So, you know, at, at some point I felt like, you know, race was, you know, there was this void where race and horror wasn't being discussed. And, um, and, and so, you know, that was, that was just the idea in itself. And then it just became about, you know, finding imagery and starting to connect the dots of what, what was I really trying to say with this movie? And then in the beginning, when I was first writing it, it was really, you know, designed to be a wake up call to the fact that, you know, the, the monster of racism that hasn't, has, has gone nowhere. It's just changed forms in the last couple hundred years. Um, and definitely did I, did I, did I, I, you know, as far as like connecting to it, it was like, uh, you know, I, I did, I, so you make a movie with, you know, trying to, I'm not the kind of, you know, con creator that, that is like, you know, kind of like a, a come to me sort of guy, mm-hmm. which you know, you know, there's there's a lot of people out there that I really respect who, you know, could give a shit whether or not you get their vision. They're they're just doing it for themselves. Um, I'm just built a different way. I'm wired a different way. So, you know, I'm trying to like my idols are like Spielberg and you know Tarantino and people who are are just trying to give the audience, uh, you know, as perfect an experience. As, as as possible, so it was definitely designed to resonate and t- sort of take mm-hmm. off and be entertaining. Still, you think there's going to be some kind of blind spot? Like, what am I not? What am I not doing right? And you know, of course, there are you know, there's mistakes that you know I, only I will see, and only I will know until I die. <laughs> 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 but but um. But yeah, I'm, 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 I couldn't be more thrilled and feel like validated. You know, all all that work was uh, wasn't for naught. Yeah, yeah, definitely, it was an amazing film. So um, you were just talking about um, some of your favorites. So, like, what are your favorite horror movies? And did anyone, any of them, directly influence Get Out? Yeah, they all did. You know, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'll start with you know, dreams or sort of images that are bubbling out of my subconscious. But then from that point forward, I'm, I'm kind of applying those right like, moments of inspiration with all my favorite shit. So, you know, the, the Stepford Wives, Rosemary's Baby, mm-hmm. um, the, Shi- the Shining, uh, uh, there's some Halloween, there's a movie called Martyrs. Um, movie called, uh, you know, Funny Games. Oh, Funny Games um, messed up. <laughs> I see that now. Funny Games messed up. Funny Games messed up. Funny Games is, you know, another one of my favorite scenes in Get Out is very Funny Games. Um, it's very much based on what I love about Funny Games, where, you know, Funny Games, one, you know, one of the first scenes of the movie is, you know, there's sort of, you know, the gentleman comes to the door and without giving away spoilers, it, it becomes very clear that this sort of normal conversation has this impending violence that's coming. And um, all parties know that this is not going in the right direction, but still everyone's kind of upholding the pleasantry. So it's this sort of social stalemate. And the, um, the keys scene in, in Get Out is very much mm-hmm. based on this idea of like, okay, Everybody knows what everybody knows in the scene, but still the the sort of the the, the scene hasn't broken yet. We haven't um, we haven't all acknowledged what's going on, and it's just this great sort of building of, of tension and this yeah. sort of this sort of social construct that keeps 
this, uh, um, you know, it keeps this, us polite rather than running out the door. Yes, 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 exactly. Um, and it's, I, I, it's just such a cool balancing act that, that for me. But anyway, um, you know, Candyman has some influence yes. here. Um, <laughs> misery. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Rose is Annie Wilkes mm-hmm. through and through. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I love about misery is like, yeah, the villain, first of all, the villain is the least likely villain. You know, it's, it's this beautiful cabin in the, you know, snowy woods or whatever. And there's this woman who's like cool. She's like an aunt, you know, and just subverting that and finding the the scariest version of that person is just so cool to me. So that's kind of what I did with the whole family. Yeah. It's like now that you're naming them, I can see pieces of them in the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everybody's got this, this, you know, just disarming um, uh, charisma. You know, it's like you don't, you know, you you don't hate Brad, you don't hate, uh, or you don't hate Dean, you don't hate Missy. Um, you maybe hate uh, Jeremy a little bit, but yeah. at the same time, you kind of <laughs> immediately. <laughs> you still, you still kind of like him because he's such a nut, he's such a fucking nut job, <laughs> and there, there is something about him where he you know he's the guy who's uh not really wearing a mask you know yeah um in that scene so he's he's sort of like you, you know you're getting more from him uh in in terms of information um so um but yeah yeah it's uh it's the whole thing was about trying to take what should be harmless and should be um, trivial and kind of revealing the dark, the, the dark on the belt. Okay. So while this film is wildly regarded as a horror film, there are still comedic twists um, that you managed to add into the story. Was it hard to rein in the more comedic side of you for the story to remain dark the way you wanted it? Um, no, not, not hard. You know, I've got a good discipline with my, you know, with, uh, believe it or not, with, uh, with the comedy thing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's basically like anything that's too funny or that's too much of a joke. Um, you have to take away. Mm-hmm. That's pretty much it. But it's just all got to work within the realm of the, the reality of the film. Mm-hmm. And um, a, a lot of us, and myself included, have been fans of yours for a number of years now. Um, and this film has shown a different side of you that we're, than we're used to. So um, what has the response been like from your longtime friends and even from close friends of yours? Uh, you know, it's, it's just been so, it's been so cool. You know, I mean, so many people have been hearing about this for a while and, um, you know, I uh, I just feel so blessed to have have gotten to do this process this way and really be able to surround myself with people who trusted um, trusted me um, even even before I trusted myself. You know, sometimes um, it's so cool. Well, I'm Torche. Um so. Upon um, re-watching it for the second or third time, not going to tell on myself, um, I was really drawn into the music of the, um, of the movie. And some of the songs were Run, Rabbit, Run, um, the Stay Woke song, um, the song with the... Um, Mm-hmm. Like Healy lyrics, yes, and I, I was like, wow! It looks like you put a lot of detail when you made these music choices. So, what messages were you trying to send the audience um, when you know deciding on these these songs? Well, you know, I just I love when a horror movies take a 
it's kind of like the misery thing that you know a horror movie will take a uh, upbeat or what's supposed to be a happy song and sort of turn it south forever. Uh, my favorite example is in Gremlins when she's going, you know, the mother's going up the stairs and and on the record. Yes. In the movie is playing, <laughs> yes. Do you hear what I do? Oh my god! <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's just. It's so creepy. And then, like, anytime you ever hear that song again, it's, it's, it's forever used, creepy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's always associated it's with that movie. Creepy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and it's kind of It's kind of a horror trope to do that, but I definitely wanted to do that myself. Um, so, um, you know, Run, Rabbit, Run, you know, the first scene, it was just about finding what could be the, the scariest song and really set us up that this is, this is a horror movie. It's not a comedy. Um, and Run Rabbit Run, you know, it's like it it, it has some, yeah. you know, like racial connotations. It's this it's this team Flanagan and Allen. It really is, you know, essentially, you know, like a this weird minstrel song, but then that was, uh, um, you know, appropriated by this 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 white duo, and so it had all this this kind of cultural thing going on but then of course it's just scary it's just creepy mm-hmm. um and then um you know red bone by childish gambino that was one of the last things that happened i got him in to watch the movie and he uh um he loved it i you know i pitched this this song i actually originally pitched it in a different place but moved it to this one i kind of figured out it was perfect here but um, it just sets us off liking this protagonist. Uh, we relate to him. He's contemporary. He's woke. He's not an idiot. Um, it just is the perfect, and it just happens to fit in with the the visual so so well. Um, uh, you know, it was already an edited visual. The song just lined up so perfectly. It was awesome. And then the you know the time of our lives, the dirty dancing song. That was another thing where it's just like, what is what's the what is it? What's the what's the most iconic thing? You know, wanted to get that character having like a stunted growth and kind of be you know kind of still be a little girl at heart in this weird twisted way. Um, and uh, you know the irony of it being this, you know, she does kind of have this weird um, obsession with her collection of <laughs> of, of uh, victims. Yeah, like dolls, um, like teddy bears almost. <laughs> right, right. It's, you know, it's, yeah. it's such a fun, such a fun character because you can just, <laughs> uh, you know, like we were saying, you can put just any little detail. We know, we know so little about her, but any little detail. Um, taint such broad strokes. Uh, um, so yeah, it was that. Wow. So I'm sure that your social media has been blowing up with the growing fan theory surrounding Get Out. I want to apologize personally to you for my part in that as well because I put out a particularly <laughs> obtuse one about the um, <laughs> milk and um, fruit loops but um, yeah. I wanted to know what your um, thoughts were about them um, I know a lot of the symbolism within the movie was intentional um, but how much of it just so happened to work out um, you know it's it, it, I, I think most of it is intentional I mean the um, the you know the the real reason I went with the Fruit Loops and Milk was more than anything, you know, to, to sort of it, it was the best it was the best thing to give me the um, that stunted growth, the psych, the psychology, this meticulous yeah. sort of selector that she is. Um, but you know, yeah, why why while, while we were shooting it. Um, or, um, like I said, it was like, you know, it was like a day before we shot that, I, you know, I'm just trying to rack my head on the, you know, what the snack is. And I do believe the, um, 
the you know just the aesthetic of you know of the the white the white milk and the and the, the colored fruit loops was what made that the made that the sort of tiebreaker um i can't remember what the other option was um you know i think so like, if it had been like cocoa pebbles it would have been like a different story <laughs> yeah i thought i thought that was too on would be too on the nose um <laughs> and uh, yeah and uh you know there's something about the the you know going you know so much so much of the decision was really aesthetic but yeah. you know all the all the little fan theories did occur to me at some point but what wasn't um you know, weren't necessarily the things that I thought the world would be keyed into. I thought it would be like, oh, you know, like some, you know, some people, you know, some some film theory, maybe somebody will be writing essays and sort of find this stuff. But it's just so cool to see that that's what kind of fascinates people. Um, and when people key into things like the, the cotton picking moment, which, yeah. mm. you know, I, you know, I remember when I told the the producers about that moment, you know, they were like, <laughs> yeah, no one's ever going to, no one's ever going to think of that. And so I'm like, yeah, you're right. No, that's like, that's a step too deep, but, um, but I'll put it in there anyway for the, the deep cut nerds. <laughs> and, um, the good news is we're all kind of deep cut nerds right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, do we know them? because <laughs> it went right over my head <laughs> I've, I've seen yeah I've but there's a ton there's a ton so of many like of that. these theories that I've, and I've, I'm loving them like I've seen like a get out syllabus people like <laughs> talking about some of these theories and teaching um, you know breaking analyzing the film and teaching it in classes and I'm just like whoa this is this is amazing <laughs> it's so uh, it's so cool it's like you couldn't have a dream you know i sort of i i was sort of thought like you know this is how this is kind of how you know everybody got it who's making movies they're kind of doing this stuff but um you know it's only when you get to watch it a bunch of a bunch of times do you get to key into that so the way that social media has uh helped this movie you know i just you know, I know there's uh you know, I'm I'm gonna definitely employ the same tactic with future films, you know. Wow. Well, we certainly cannot wait to your next film. And uh Jordan, I know you're a very busy man, so I just wanna say thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us tonight. And for our listeners, um, where can they find you on social media and um on the interwebs? I'm Jordan Peel on Twitter, and I'm Jordan Peel on Instagram, and that's it. That's it. Those, those are the only places you're going to find me on the web. Excellent. Get Out is in theaters yeah. now. Check it out, guys. It's amazing. You created a Thank masterpiece. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> oh, my gosh, you guys. I mean, that means so much. That, um, I'm, uh, I, I couldn't be happier with uh, your support and... Um, so just the fact that people 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 do get it thank you oh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you check out segment two it's a round table featuring joy Quran Torah and Mel okay welcome guys to another episode of black girl nerds I am your host joy and with us, I have some special guests. I have Tora, Karan, and Mel. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you. And I'm here too. <laughs> you were always here, Tora. You were always with us. <laughs> and I helped. <laughs> and I too am present. <laughs> um, so, if you guys aren't aware, uh, we obviously saw one of the best films that came out in the month of February, just to kind of cap off Black History Month, and that was Get Out, um, was as of, uh, well, prior to this week, 100% fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, a horror, pil- uh, horror film written and directed by uh, Jordan Peele. You know him from Key and Peele. You know him from Keanu. 
Um, and so we're going to talk about it. So, ladies, in the order of let's do Tora, Karan, and then Mel. Um, what, what, did, what was your overall thoughts about Get Out? Um, well, it's still 100% fresh. That that one rating is fake news. So <laughs> I'm not going to take facts. that. Those are alternative facts. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> Um, I I love the movie and I went into it kind of so I love a, a good dark comedy and that's what I went into it expecting. I went into it expecting not to be scared, but to get a few chills and to have some chuckles because I have been kind of numbed to horror movies like I, I've watched some shit. So <laughs> I was just like, mm, this ain't gonna get me. You know what I mean? Like, there's no way. Mm-hmm. Y'all. Like, okay. It was scary. And it wasn't just um, just scary in the sense that it, it was graphically scary. It was scary in that it was a psychological thriller in in the way that it taps into um, black America's deepest, darkest fears. So it was legit scary. Like me and my Sora were holding onto each other's hands and I, the lights were off because we got there on CP time. So I didn't realize how black the theater were was until the last 20 minutes. And we were all like, we told you not to fuck with her in the first place. <laughs> Literally every, <laughs> it became like a community watching experience <laughs> and everyone screaming like, uh, uh-uh, no, like there's this one point where the, I'm not going to have any spoilers, but like a police car shows up and where everyone goes goes like oh no now he gonna go down for it (laughs) like literally everyone yells like some version of that and it was just such a like that literally my blood ran cold at that moment because that was a you know that that's one of those fears that it's really hard to express in unless you've lived it and it's hard to put into horror. And I just honestly wasn't expecting it. And it really blew me away. So I loved the movie. This is Karan. Um, mm, honey. This was the American Horror Story. Mm-hmm. This not only, I think when you said chills and chuckles, that is perfect a perfect way to describe how you felt throughout and didn't know sometimes which one you should do. <laughs> Cause sometimes, <laughs> you know, it might've, it might've been a, you know, a questionable circumstance where you probably should, it probably should not have been funny, but it was funny as hell. Mm-hmm. Um, and what was scary was scary as hell. Um, I think it not only tapped into black America's deepest fears, but also our deepest realities. Those realities mm-hmm. that other people deny on a daily, daily basis as if the stuff doesn't happen. Um, I, the movie was brilliant. The film was, it was fucking brilliant. It was just, from start to finish, there was not a single moment dropped. There was not a single waste of space. There was not a waste of time. There was not a waste of effort. There was not uh, a waste of connection. I just, I really thoroughly enjoyed it and it scared the hell out of me because it's not that far-fetched um and i i just i thought it was absolutely I, it was absolutely brilliant and and for it what you said about horror movies i've gotten so bored with horror movies they're not scary it's just blood and gore or mm-hmm. somebody with a black wig jumping out of a tv or you know just no imagination this not only was imaginative but it was enough of a creative force to not only tap into your imagination but made you question your reality as well and um there was not a single person young or old who did not talk to that screen at some point and 
everyone in there, just like you said, said you shouldn't mess with that white girl. <laughs> you know, it's the white girl. And it's so funny. I was at a dinner party the other night. Um, fantastic event um, here in Charlotte um, called Soul Food Sessions. And um, one of my dinner mates was asking whether or not she should let her 15-year-old go see the movie. And I told her, yeah. And she said, well, you know, my 15-year-old, you know, we raised our kids differently than we were raised. And, you know, he doesn't necessarily have black friends. That necessarily, he's not surrounded by, you know, us. I said, that's why you need to send him. Mm-hmm. And she said, you know, because Becky is an issue. I said, if you send him to this movie, <laughs> Becky will no longer be an issue. <laughs> Trust me. It's okay. <laughs> But I thought I thought the film was brilliant. I enjoyed, I enjoyed myself thoroughly. I'll probably go see it again uh, within the next week. Um, I enjoyed myself so immensely in that film. Just, it, you could pull any moment out of that film and, and 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 do a dissertation on it. It was it was brilliant. It was not confusing. It was clear. It was linear. It was. Um, it made almost made too much damn sense. <laughs> Are you done? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, thought you, I thought you were in the middle of a, a thought. I was like, I'm wait a minute. I'm always in the this? middle of a thought, but I actually am done. <laughs> okay. Um, so for me, that it was that first scene where Darius from Atlanta is walking down the street in that clean ass neighborhood. And it Le reminded Keith, me. Lakeith. Yes. So, like, I used to live in upstate New York, and the neighborhood I lived in, the one half was, like, the white... Actually, the entire neighborhood was pretty much the white half, but one half was the (laughs) rich white half, and the other half was considered the bad part because it had, like, three black families. Mm -hmm. So the cops just stayed posted in that area all the time. So in the wintertime, I used to walk my dog in the neighborhood, so it'd be, like, 7 o'clock and pitch black dark. And then I would be walking my dog through this white part, rich part of the neighborhood, And then I would see cars, not cars, a specific car would be slowly following me down the street. And then I would look back and then he would stop and look at me because it was always like old white men who would do this. And then I'd keep on walking and he'd keep on following me. So like from that first scene, I was like, oh, already I felt uncomfortable. It got a little too close to home at that moment. So I spent pretty much the first half of the movie just really uncomfortable just really waiting for you know the shit to go down and I think for me like the scariest moment was when the um the mother hypnotized him when she started you know with the cup and asking him like these invasive questions like as soon as she started like that repetitive motion of like you know scraping the spoon against the cup i knew exactly what she was doing and at that point my skin was crawling because to me that was such an invasion i'm just like this is horrible (laughs) and that continued to be like the scariest part for me i was like that somebody can control your mind like that and that they'd even think to stop before they did it they just did it to me that's horrifying Mm -hmm. so yeah and privilege (laughs) yeah 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 so for me, this movie hit a little too close to home. <laughs> it hit way too close to home. I didn't appreciate that, but <laughs> by the end, <laughs> by the end, I was like, I was, I was, I was with it because I was like, you know what? Everybody needs to die. I'm right there with you. Just burn it all down. I, if I was, <laughs> I would have gone back to the house and burnt the shit down in the ground. That was the only thing I was saying. I was not yelling at the screen, but I was thinking it. I was like, go back and burn it. Get rid of the evidence. Burn everything. But, yeah, I really like this movie. I like it a lot. Um, so this is Joy. Uh, I absolutely loved the film. And what I loved about it the most was that it's the type of film that will, like, completely fuck you up after you see, the, after you see it. Because mm. a couple of days, like, after the film, I was, like, thinking back on the film and thinking back on what I saw. There's so many different little Easter eggs and little yes. pieces. That you don't recount until like a random moment in the week after you see it. And you'll be like, oh shit, I forgot about this. <laughs> or like, 
oh, I didn't even think about how that put two and two together. And there's, and we can, we'll be getting into it a little later about this. And for the listeners, this is, uh, this is definitely full of spoilers. So if you haven't seen it too bad, um, okay, so, so we can, we can talk, we can, we can do spoilers. I was over here trying to subvert and okay. no, well, 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 to be fair, like we already kind of technically spoiled it because in in order for you to talk about the film, you have to mm-hmm. kind of get into details. Um, okay. So if you've seen any of the interviews that anybody can and get I, out. I don't even it. think we can spoil this film, though. I think even if you tried to tell somebody play by play what happened, the ex- it, the experience of the film itself makes you feel shit. No, absolutely. That, exactly. Think, That's absolutely. what I've been trying to tell people. Like, um, because people have been mad at me about some of the things I've tweeted. And I've been like, listen, <laughs> like, there's there's no way. Like, this isn't baby honey child listen child like this is yeah no <laughs> this is the type this is the type of film that a lot of the fun facts that people have been tweeting and like stuff that they've discovered after the fact doesn't make sense until you actually visibly see yeah the film. right yeah. this is like your tweet that, that you're talking, yeah, like, the i'm not even gonna bring this is. up like that this like this is like <laughs> it's like looking at a leaf and being like how dare you show me a tree like nah baby <laughs> No, this ain't. You don't know. <laughs> so yeah, like no, but you're, you know guys what are, kind of tree it is. <laughs> yeah, so you got you guys are right, but still, it's by definition spoilers. But if you're interested in understanding some of the symbolism, continue listening. But um, overall, I, I just love that film. Um, it is nothing better than watching it in Harlem in the blackest part of Harlem at the Magic Johnson Theater with a bunch of black folk. <laughs> where people almost got into a fight the first 20 minutes into the film. That was beautiful. Um, all of us were clapping together, making comments of each other. At some point, you hear in the background, like, yo, beat that bitch. Beat her. Like, <laughs> stuff like that. Like, this greatness. This is wonderful viewing. If, you do, if you're seeing the film and you should see the film, what are you doing? I, you I watched it at a theater, very black theater in I, Charlotte, I, I okay, very, I where the, very... the seats leaned back. <laughs> I watched it at a very white theater in texas it was me and one other black girl and we somehow managed to be sitting she was sitting directly in front of me and we had reserved seats so like that was by accident just the two black women the two black people in theater sitting one in front of the other in the middle (laughs) and 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 when i went to see the film i went with with um, my daughter cam and um there were as many elderly people in that theater as they were white hipsters it was hilarious because the old black mothers and the old black oh. daddies. I I have to disagree. The best thing is watching this film with old people because they are <laughs> off the chain. Yes, I will agree with that. Oh but my specifically, God. it's another level. It's like a cherry on top when they're old black people. Oh my <laughs> God. They were there let, is they no were filter. That screen have point. It. It's really no yeah. filter. Just let it all out. Right, but I, but over so overall, fun. I love the film. It was it was such <laughs> a, a well thought out film that made you think and and mm-hmm. feel. And interviews have has been saying that oh, this is the type of film that you need to watch it twice. And he's not just saying that so he can make more money. You really is it is really that type of film. Yeah, I missed that. Yeah, really, missed that. Really yeah. really I need to watch it twice. See it again. You have four people on this podcast that are telling you you really actually do need to watch it twice. I'm poor right now, so I'm not watching it anytime soon. But while it's still in the theater, yeah, yeah we got the I was sitting in the theater, like, oh, I did on Matt playing Nets. again, like right after, like in the. I theater. was too. Can I just like sit here? <laughs> right, like yeah, but no, you should see, you should see it again. So, um, let's pivot to kind of the the next next point of topic. Um, and we we talked about it briefly, and this is where it gets super quote unquote spoily, but symbolism. And the imagery in the film, there is so much. We're obviously not going to be able to cover it, all of it because it's a lot and we haven't seen it twice and we really got to, comp, you know, compact it and like really analyze it. But talk to me um, in the same order we went before on some of the, the imagery and some of the themes that you saw that impacted you the most when you watched it the first time. Um. I think what was most noticeable for me, I think, was the recurring imagery of the deer Mm -hmm. and the rabbit. Um, 
they're they're shown like in the woods and he keeps seeing them and he keeps seeing it on the wall and it's actually facing him as he's sitting in the chair kind of frozen and if you know how um black men's bodies are sexualized and were spoken about they're they're known as bucks and um that's also the terminology for um deer and rabbits is buck so i was just like "Mm, okay way to be undercover woke (laughs) but i kept seeing it and i was just like oh all right then (laughs) were you done yeah, I, I figured somebody else would hop in and oh, say some yes. some other stuff, and I'd have time to gather myself. And <laughs> um, I thought the 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 biggest thing about this film is that it's a total mind fuck. Okay, mm-hmm. um, the hypnosis was not to serve them; it was to become them. It was to become and inhabit black bodies. And Come on, spoken word. As a black it, girl, the mind control and the possession, the what's the word, y'all? When they take everything we do, uh, appropriate appropriation. Appropriation. Mm-hmm. This takes appropriation to an entirely new level. Mm-hmm. This takes appropriation to actual possession. So instead of Instead of just wanting what we have, they become who we are. They actually found a way to put their brains in our bodies and live out their lives as us in service to themselves. Ain't that mm-hmm. some bullshit? Mm-hmm. In ser- okay, because when that bitch yelled out, Grandma, I was, girl, I could have died. I could have yeah, died. <laughs> but I'd been thinking that died. since... I had been thinking that since she was staring at herself in the, in win- the window, in the, in the window mm-hmm. I was just like, she kept adoring herself in the window. That motherfucker said, her, we was, couldn't bear to let them go. I was like, mm. uh-uh-uh. What she you was mean? staring <laughs> at her reflection. I also thought the visual imagery of him sinking into the floor. Right. And not just sinking into the floor, but sinking into infinite space. So there is a feeling of being present, but not present. You're there, but you're not there. You're everywhere and you're nowhere at the same time. So his consciousness was still there. His essence was still there as we saw when the flash Mm -hmm. went off. When the flash went off, it broke their spell. And then they had to take that teacup and stir that shit back up and get them back together. But... I just thought it was really, whoo, it was beyond powerful because it took appropriation to possession in service to themselves. They not mm-hmm. only wanted to become us, but they wanted to become us so that to make them better. So they took mm-hmm. their own dead. They took their own dead people and put them in their consciousness in an able body, semi conscious black person, and enslave them again. Mm hmm. Girl, this shit, oh, I got, oh. Mm. <laughs> the mind control so, and the possession, the, the, the hypnosis was, was, it wasn't to serve them, it was to become them in service to themselves. That's crazy. That could preach right there. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought it was also interesting the fact that they needed to hypnotize them before they performed the brain swap because it could have simply they could have just stuck to like a you know knock them out and swap brains like in some sci-fi thing but they needed to show the this aspect of powerlessness and Mm -hmm. a awareness while what you have Mm -hmm. is being taken from you and I think that's kind of you know it parallels what happens to black people like we're very aware while they take from us our bodies our Mm -hmm. lives everything so I I think that was very you know I think that was it reminded me of slavery it's like someone's raping you and making you keep your eyes open to watch 
Yep. So, yeah, like when I was um, watching it, just the because, yeah, it really did made me think of slavery because when they he they set him down. So you're conscious, but you have no control over what is being done to your body. Right. It's the white people around you who have control of what's happening to your body. And that's basically what slavery was. So that made me think of that. And then all the the people who had been, I guess, um, transported into the black bodies. I don't know how to say that. But they were obsessed with, like, pieces of blackness. So, like, the grandmother was obsessed with the look. And the grandfather was obsessed with the strength. And then poor Darius, what that woman was obsessed with him being, you know, I don't know, his sexual proudness or something. So it's like all these pieces that, you know, media and the world get obsessed with about black people, but not the actual person. It's just pieces of them that they wanted. Who cares about the person? We can throw that away. It's just, I want what you have. Right. And, and it's what they, were st- what they stereotype us for. Mm-hmm. I thought the, the, the way the stereotypes were exploited in this film was remarkable. Everything mm-hmm. down to the conversation at that so-called party. There was not a single thing that was said that was not racist, that was not coded, that was not overt. But it was so polite. It was so polite. And those are the things that make you feel like you're crazy because when you try to say them aloud, it's, but that sounds like a nice thing that they said to mm-hmm. you. Right. And it's, no, it's like, no you, you didn't you hear it. it. <laughs> or you weren't there. Like when somebody tells me I love your hair and then they touch my hair. <laughs> I would be in prison. Sorry. I that can't. is... So disrespectful and people just don't get that because they, well, white people just don't get that because they don't experience it. People don't randomly touch their hair because they respect each other's boundaries. But then me, I'm standing there. So I'm just like open season on me. (laughs) And that's the same thing was happening to poor Chris in the movie. You can touch his biceps. You can say whatever you want to him. And then eventually you can wear him as, you know, a trench coat. (laughs) I mean, right. You're going to be in a Chris suit. <laughs> Entitlement to his bodies, to his body. Like his it's body. right. Entitlement his to his space. Future. Like it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, so, I forgot what I was, wa- I forgot um, what program it was, but some, um, some anchor basically said something really shady and she touched. Charles. Um, ch- yes. And she was so offended when he said, don't, don't touch, touch me. me. And she was just like, uh, 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 oh, so I can't touch you? Uh, yes. Aren't we supposed to be Americans? And he was like, no. You, what the, what you, I, touching me, bitch? What does that have to do with you touching me? Like you can't, when, bl- when black people assert their space, when they assert their, you know, boundaries, there is an issue because there, so many white people have grown up with this assumption of, you know, this now, idea that there they're, serve them? yeah, that they mm-hmm. can touch us, that they're entitled to our bodies. So it, it's mind boggling to it's them. And also the universal <laughs> white symbol for calm down. Right. It's, I, also, I would it's, say, the, it's the universal white symbol for calm down. You're overreacting, would, I, dear. You're overreacting. It's like the, it's like the Southern fuck you. The Southern fuck you is bless your heart. You know? Also, when know a child says, bless place. your heart with a touch. <laughs> You know, that's I say that all the time. I love saying that. (laughs) uh, But I think you make a great point, Karan, because the thing I overall kind of took away in terms of the symbolism and and the imagery was so many callbacks to slavery and and, and what that looked like. Like Mm -hmm. the bingo auction Mm -hmm. uh, with his photo Mm -hmm. uh, in the gazebo, and they're auctioning off his body um, from uh, some of the. the, white attendees at the the little dinner party feeling up on his mm-hmm. arms and saying that he's strong and fit um to look at the type of people they were that um Rose his girlfriend was grabbing they were typically ones that had a utility cuz Chris was a photographer and yeah. uh uh Drew cool. slash Logan was a jazz musician um cuz that's what Rod looks mm-hmm. up on Google so these are you know black folk who are yeah. talented cuz you know only you know black folk are only good for sports and music 
So that's what right. they did in slavery. They would right. sell exactly people based off of their talent. <laughs> even the, yeah, even the grandma and the grandpa, the you know, black mothers in the in the house tending to the to the home. A uh, uh, big, strong black man is tending to the field. He's cutting. He's cutting. He's chopping wood. He's uh, he's the landscaper. Like there's so many different callbacks to slavery. My I wonder favorite if call- he was like, was he actually, or were they just doing that as a show for? Chris? I don't. You know what? I don't necessarily know because I was asking that too. You don't. You know. You never know because them folks were out. I think there. they were just like keeping themselves busy. You know what I mean? I think that that may have been what they liked to do. Yeah, anyway. like if you if you're a certain age, so let's say throwing it up in the air, they're in like their 80s or 90s. They don't necessarily want a new body to like travel the world. They just want to be able to do simple things that they took for granted when they were younger, maybe. And maybe chopping wood and tending to the house and keeping a low profile so they can, you know, uh, trap more black people is what they're interested in. But I think the one piece of like slavery callback that I, I that really grabbed my attention and didn't really hit me until a couple of days after I saw the film was you notice how he was able to break out of the stronghold from the brother um, by hitting him in the wall. He put cotton in his ear. He was picking cotton because he picked mm-hmm. the cotton mm-hmm. from the chair <laughs> yeah. and put it in his ear. So cotton. he wouldn't. Yeah, picking that cotton. So a lot of subtle and overtly blatant callbacks to slavery. If you're looking at it mm-hmm. the right way, I have an, uh, I have another another thing that I picked up on. Every last one of them were drawn in through a sexual relationship and were immediately desexualized. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Even the one who was being used and married off to the old white lady, the old fat white lady. Um, she constantly talked about his sexual prowess but he was desexualized he was completely de- he was dressed like farmer ted you know um the even even the woman the uh the the maid she was drawn in through because the white girl met her at a club you they know? were engaged if you notice they in were the engaged picture. they were engaged yeah. They, if you notice in the picture, one that. of them has an, an engagement ring. And I mm. peeped that and I was like, wait, were they engaged at the time? Like when they did this? But I thought Rose it was just trash. Her, uh, <laughs> yeah, roses. We like, let's let's make that very clear. Rose is utterly trash. And I don't think anybody should have played her but Allison Williams because she plays a trash ass character as Marnie on Girls. So I it gotta, means. I got to say, you know, I don't know whether to show appreciation or anger for these white people that took part in this film. Because they were right. so, it, it it would not have been, and I hate to give white people more credit than it's due, but they really did the damn thing with this mm-hmm. film. They really yeah. brought this vision full circle because they were so good at the roles that they played. They they really were, because you can say a lot of things about Allison, but that bitch played the, the, devil, white, the devil white girl. Oh, absolutely! Really it's well. it's kind of like it's kind of like Leo and Django. Yeah, like, he plays a slave master really good. <laughs> You're just like, I don't know how. I feel Where about are you this. pulling that from? Right. right. Where is this coming from? I guess your Leo ancestors didn't me come at to you me. at night. And, I mean, Leo uh, didn't bother me as much because he was so <laughs> over the top. He no, was so over the top, and it was okay because it fit the, the movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, it it felt it fit with the movie because the movie was over the top. Everything was grand yeah. and big in that movie. But Rose, I could know Rose. Like that's someone I could actually know right now. That's probably yeah. one of my there, daughter's the friends. moment. I'm like, yeah, that bitch ain't coming in my house. The Not moment today. that she switched felt so familiar to me oh because oh. I have been in situations with. She held that line for a while, though, didn't she? With white girls who have played innocent Mm -hmm. and then like to bosses or to, you know, professors and, you know, been fucking me over and laughed in my, you know, laughed in my face. So that that moment where she switched from innocent to, you know, I was never going to give you the keys. Right, babe. That moment was just so fucking triggering for me yeah. i was just like this bitch yeah. like, <laughs> and then the phone <laughs> call with the friend <laughs> right it's a familiar so scary. Scary. Mm-hmm. It's, it's and i think it was karan who said it, it's like this is not far-fetched like um to something that could have happened in our history yeah. with our ancestors 
years or even well, today us. in 2017, that could happen to us. So let's let's pivot on to like the last topic. And if you had to have any like one or two major takeaways that you got after seeing the film, what would those be and, and why? One or two takeaways. Yeah, this I know it's it's so it's so hard so hard to like like narrow it down. But like, what was your personal like moral of the story that you got? Because I think you can have a lot of like summaries of what the film was from where you're at in your life. But for you and your perspective, what was like those major like summaries or or, or takeaways? I guess, uh, firstly, um. If your gut mm. and the ancestors are trying to tell you something. <laughs> and your friend. And your friend who clearly, you know, got black instincts better than you. Maybe. Love. Love is a silly thing. May Uh-uh. Maybe listen, I, and, and I mean, I know it's funny to like make jokes like don't trust, you know, don't be messing with because I mean, I'm not gonna, you know, down all interracial relationships because, you know, if that's that's silly, but if you're able to work through the if you're ever to, if you're able to find a trustworthy white and work through the um, uh, history of oppression. And I, I know that that's a battle. Uh, more power to you. Um, but when your mama says, warns you about them white girls, maybe listen. What else would I say? Takeaways from the movie. Um, to white people that are just watching this movie and going, wow, really? It's, is it that bad? Um, yes. Shut up. We don't want your takes. That's it. This is Quran, and <laughs> my first takeaway is the kingdom suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Come on, Bible verses. That's the, that's the first thing that came to my mind when this movie ended, for real. Um, and language uh, riots are the language of the oppressed. You know, we fight when we have to, but never back down. Follow your instinct, trust your gut, and learn the lesson the first time. So in summary, it's in the text, Saints. And text can be anything. It's in the text. I know some Bible I'm verses. I'm just saying. I'm just saying when um, she who is without si- wait uh, <laughs> an eye <laughs> for an eye. Uh, I'm, just well, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I know that's not the right one. The, um, well, the the truth of the matter is, well, uh, you're not in control unless you take it, mm-hmm. and sometimes that control has to happen violently I'm not saying it has to happen bloodily but violently yeah. meaning you have to make some really hard fucking decisions about your life and what you want it to be and who you form your alliances with Ooh, I love I, that. it was really important that my daughter saw this film with me I, I didn't realize how important it was because we were just we were just pumped to see the movie you know but when we there was so much dialogue that was that came out of that film because it was so profound in so many ways and you know without getting too deep the truth of the matter is everybody want to be a nigga but don't nobody want to be a nigga thank you Paul Mooney uh-huh. <laughs> um, we y- you always gonna be black you always I don't care how many other flavors you have within your bloodstream you always gonna be black as long as you wear brown skin and I don't care how, I don't care how much they take from you. There's still a part of your consciousness that still exists that can still warn somebody else to get out. You in trouble because I didn't been there. Listen to your eldest children. Whew. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> um, I think for me. It was just another reminder 
as the past couple of months have been that no matter how much we think things have changed, they haven't really changed that much. Mm. So it made me think of that and made me in a good way, I guess, think, you know, you're not crazy. This stuff is happening. This stuff is messed up. Um, can't kill everybody who does it, though. But um, what else? I think that's all I have for now. Yeah, I think everybody else pretty much said it. Um, my takeaways were a couple. So my first one was, and in the nicest way possible, because I think Tori was right, we're not here to down or kind of play interracial relationships. But I do think white people in your life will come and go. But there's something specifically unique and nuanced of, about black relationships. Mm-hmm. And black relationships doesn't necessarily automatically have to go to the sexual or the romantic. Um, in this case, for the film, his black relationship was Rod. Yes, and I don't think he yes. understood the, mag- the magnitude of that relationship. Because if you notice, when they were on, when they were uh, overlooking the water and he told Rose, you are my only family that I have. Mm-hmm. She didn't save him at the end. It was Rod who came looking for him with no prior information. Mm-hmm. He went with his gut. He Dang actually... Girl. Was- yeah, he actually listened to the ancestors TSA. and picked the boy up. TSA. Like, the fact that that is a relationship that is mm-hmm. so special and unique and nuanced that we just have that 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 invisible but golden link amongst other black people. Then when we're in danger or we need somebody, there is somebody there out there for you. And that doesn't mean that that doesn't disregard whatever relationship you have, black, white, or indifferent, but no matter what white people come and go in your life, whether it be relationships, friendships, in the romantic or sexual, whatever sense, like black relationships are very nuanced and they're special and they should be cherished and appreciated. And I think that that film did it, especially since I found it interesting that Peel is married to a white woman. He's about to have a kid soon. They and already had the baby, he, I think. Oh, they already had the baby? So yeah, like yeah. he has a kid, he's married to a white woman and he was able to, his mother's white. Also. Yeah, his mother. His mother. Yeah, white. he's a product of that. So, and he's I a mean, product of that, and he was still able to showcase a black loving relationship in their own special way. Because he's still a black man. Right. Exactly. And that. And that's the point that that Karan gave. I think the other point I had was, um, just how we have an ability to code switch. So do white people. Mm-hmm. There's code switching in this story was very evil. Tori, you touched on it with uh, Rose doing that sw- quick switch. Those are the ones who will be laughing and kikiing with you. But we'll call the cops on you if, if you have a little noise disruption in your house. Um, but notice the, the the code switching that Chris was doing. When he was talking to Rose, it's starkly different than when he picked up the phone and talked to Rod. I think it goes back to mm-hmm. those black relationships. And we know we know that 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 struggle of not everybody is going to get it if they don't live a similar life experience. And I think that, that you not only showed that in the film, but Peel did a, a magnificent way of having that experience happen live with the black audience members. So if you sat with even one black person at the theater like you did, Mel, at minimum, <laughs> to a whole theater, mostly a black folk, like majority of us, like there's a specific moment where there are parts where you did the specific black moaning that you did in this film and groaning and like, oh no, and like, laughing you know there's a lot of scoffing i did a lot of scoffing right a lot of scoffing like these are noises that like the white person next to you are just like probably looking at you like what do you what what part are you getting from that but there's something (laughs) that if all of us watched the movie again together i guarantee you we would laugh at the same parts we would scoff at the same parts we were grown at the same parts. We would roll our eyes at the same parts. Like these are just a jump at the same parts too. Exactly. Like these are these are a living shared experience. And and overall, what's beautiful about black creatives is we can take a genre that has been beaten over the head. Mm-hmm. Horror films have been around a long time. And we literally, from just our natural brilliance, can flip it upside the head that makes it the most terrifying thing it could ever be. There is no horror film, I don't care what classics there are, there is no film scarier than this because this is actually real life. And right. it could really happen. <laughs> you can't have Freddy come into your house. You can't have Jason come into your house. You could surely have a Rose come to your place though. Oh God. <laughs> or so, she could invite I, you up to I, her, I think her it's place. also important to point out that this is not a movie 
a film about all white people are bad. Because it's all white people are not bad. This is a film that reflects the result of what white people have done. This is called come up and steer. This is what, this is what, this is, this is an ode to the current state of affairs and the history of this country. This is a not so loving love song. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a throwback to slavery. It's a slow. Ba- it's a throwback to indentured servitude. It's a throwback to sharecroppers. It's a throwback to Elvis taking music from black artists. Take, Experimentation of black yes. people. <laughs> Henrietta Lacks, James Brown. See, that's what Everybody. I liked about this movie because it was like the flip side of what you usually see with. Um, movies that deal with racism it's not a bunch of white people running around saying oh they hate all the black people we need to kill them we need to do this it's a bunch of seemingly nice white people running around taking pieces of black people that they like and then leaving without asking without even thinking about the person as (laughs) as you know an actual human being with feelings and agency they're just going around and taking them as if we're we're dolls and then you just want this outfit for this doll, or you want your doll to have brown hair instead of blonde hair. You're just <laughs> it's I Vogue. Can't. It's no. Yeah, no. It's uh, you know what it it's is. It's the runways. It's it's well, <laughs> Dora, it's I think every putting, music genre. It's, it's, it's yeah, putting it's, it's putting blackface and an Afro wig on a blonde model um, for <laughs> fuck it. It's a Kardashian. Mm hmm. It, it's, it's a yeah, lot of it's Kardashian it taking everything. You, you know what it is? It's that spoken word poem Kanye West ex girlfriend did on YouTube. You look hungry. Oh, girl. <laughs> I feel it, girl. Oh, my girl. And Tora. But uh, to, to end it on this note, you guys make an excellent point. Um, I think overall it's. I think this is the first story where, look, in this political climate, in this current day and age, we have, quote unquote, extreme cases of whiteness. We have the KKK, we have neo-Nazis, stuff like that. And there are liberal to moderate white people in the last couple of years during the Obama era when when this film was, was made and created, where they were like, well, we're not those white people. Those are the other white people. But this is a film about them, the other white who is the other white people, right? So it's co- t- touching all cylinders. We've had plenty of films that showcase how Jim Crow and slavery mm-hmm. has been evil, and in how yeah. um, how we've had like these these scenarios where there were white folks who then and today were those white hoods. But these are ones that aren't wearing white hoods. These are people that live in your neighborhood who mm-hmm. think that they're well meaning, but that they. They're owed a piece of you. The people you work with. These are for the people who touch your hair without just touch it. People who touch you. Yep. The this, people these are, who talk these, about, hey, you know, I have this one black friend. Have you met them? Right. These it's are the white people. These are the white people that think I know the Obamas. Right. I would have voted for a certain term, but like uh, it's more. Most importantly, these are the these are the white people that MLK talked about when we were talking about it's the white moderate. The well-meaning whites, the white yes. moderate, the white the moderate. ones, the ones who bought safety pins but didn't actually check to see if anyone was safe. The one who wore pink hats during the women's march, but uh, constantly used phrasing that wasn't inclusive to trans women of color. These are those white people. So let's just stop being divisive. We're all women, aren't we? Aren't the we? Susan Sarandons. These are the Susan Sarandons. The well, ones who are... What's wrong with the pussy shit. hat? All yeah. women have pussies. Well, don't they? Yeah. Is this Selma mm. Hayek's? There's a lot of... It's a lot <laughs> the of so, oh, the Selma Hayek's. Oh, my those, God. Those... those those women that tell you to stop being divisive when you try oh, yes. to bring up trans inclusive oh, yeah, feminism. Yeah. <laughs> these are the white these are the white people who invite you over their house and then don't <laughs> tell you when they have a racist relative also going to be there. These the are the ones, ones who, who try to explain away grandma explain being away. old. 
<laughs> or or these are the ones who use oh there were no uh there's no violence during the women's march as a bargaining chip bargaining as if to say that black lives matter protests are so much lesser than theirs black lives Ooh, that matter. scene when rose confronted the cop oh yeah and she That's- just went off on him yeah, yep. I was like, yeah, just, the just cop flash that power. Out his name. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, in total, in sum, for all of this, um, please go see Get Out. Obviously, we had a lot to say and a lot on our chest about it, and there's so much more conversation to have. Uh, to Taurus' point, like ignore the haters who are trying to make it less than the 100 percent fresh that it should be. That is alternative facts. That is fake news. Like, there's an excellent film done by a wonderful uh, black filmmaker who's new to the scene, who has been an incredible writer, who has done really great work in the world of like black comedy. Um, and he's now pivoted oh and to this arena. I hope he's given us more. I hope there's more. I he said, said, he said, he said he's, he's going to be doing a bunch, of, a bunch of movies on quote unquote social demons. So that's something we can look out this for. Was so. such, this was I such have an a idea full for one. And well-rounded story. This was such <laughs> a complete story it's it, it, it reminded me of the fact that it's been a very long time since we mm-hmm. have seen a whole story yeah absolutely and so thank you guys for listening um until next time bye bye, bye. bye. <laughs> <laughs> the church is in the background <laughs> okay yay The Black Girl Nerds Podcast is produced by Jamie Brodnax. Various episodes are edited by Jamie Brodnax, M.R. Daniel, and John Bauer. The opening theme song to our show is written and performed by Samus. Various instrumentals are performed by Samus, Sky Blue, and Shubzilla. You can find episodes of the Black Girl Nerds Podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play Music, Stitcher, Spreaker, and Spotify. That was a HeadGum Podcast.